Welcome to the last video on balances as guides towards a sustainable future. Today I would like to discuss a little bit what does that mean for us, for us today, each of us, um, and put that means putting all the things we have seen a little bit into perspective. And finally derive some conclusions. The first slide I would like to look at is the overall fertility in children per woman as a function of GDP per capita in United States dollars for different nations. And we see that less developed nations with a low GDP have a very high fertility. This means that actually if they develop, we have discussed that before, these dots, the size of which represents the overall population in that country, will significantly increase. On the other hand side, if we have a GDP somewhat above, say, 2,000 US dollars per capita, that means that the uh, fertility rate is at a level where the population, the overall population, is more or less constant. If we are around 2.1 or 2.3 different sources, give different numbers, um, children per woman, we wind up with a more or less constant population. So it is important to really take care of these people up here, these nations, because if they develop, even if they only develop, their population will significantly grow. We have discussed that, that this is the demographic transition leading to a strong growth in, in, in the population as first the death rate decreases and then only the fertility drops. I want to show this a little bit and show this exemplarily for, the, for China because I want to make a different point here as well. We see the fertility in red, the population growth in percent given at the, as a blue curve and the life expectancy at birth in green. And here we see that well, first the life expectancy increased and then the birth rate where the fertility dropped. So here in this time period the development so to speak started. At that time the population growth annually was pretty high which means as nations develop there will be significant population growth during that time period. So it is important to keep that time sh as short as possible. We have discussed that already. Then in China, the one-child policy was put into place, starting here, 1979. At that point, actually, the fertility started to drop significantly. Not to one child per family, but, well, dropped below two with a certain lag, so to speak. Nevertheless, the population growth is not zero yet, simply because they have children being produced in this, at this point, so to speak, that now also want to have their single child. Because they want to have their child, the overall population is still growing. This means there's really a significant lag of 20 to 30 years where the people now want to have their children, where population is growing, even though the demographic transition took already place. So there is a significant lag. And this actually shows how important it was for China to, uh, to well, have this one-child policy. If this would not have been taken, if that would not have been uh, proposed, what then would happen that the fertility would be high and the population growth would be significantly higher, leading to dramatic problems in China. And we know the problems that they are having today, so it's not a trivial task, you see. And that hints already at something that I want to discuss. On the one hand side, we say, in Europe we say, well, how can China um, demand that families have only one child? How can that be? That's their personal right to have as many children as, as they like. It's more or less a human right. But on the other hand side, for example, good nutrition for everybody, enough energy for everybody, that's also human right. So there are competing human rights and we have somehow to decide which of these human rights is more important. China has chosen that the number of children can be limited and that reduces the problems they have today, still with a pot positive population growth overall in their society. It's not zero, so they are still growing. This leads me to another question. The question, well, Apparently there are difficulties that occur, can occur in certain regions, certain nations. And I read this very interesting book from Jared Diamond, Collapse, 
how societies choose to fail or survive. He compared different nations, different actually different regions in at times very long ago. For example, the Easter Islands, they were populated, people built up these nice uh, fancy uh, stone uh, figures, so to speak, that everybody knows from the Easter Islands. And the, there, so there was a lively population there, and somehow that break, broke down. How come? And he investigated several of these uh, civilizations, small regions, re regional civilizations, and investigated what happened, how they declined, or how they survived. And he formulates that the, the, that the societies themselves choose to fail or survive because it's their own behavior in the end that determines what's going on. Well, there are five points he found out that are critical. One is environmental destruction. For example, in the Easter Islands, the forests have been uh, cut down for whatever purposes, and that really led to a pretty uh, bad fate. That also leads such things like uh, environmental destruction lead to a change in the local climate, the microclimate. And that can be detrimental to the overall society, the supply of food, for example, for this society. Hostile neighbors, whether they are not so positive is more or less obvious, but also fr friendly trading partners, that's important, because perhaps you depend on them in the end. The Easter Islands, for example, depended on ships coming by, bringing them certain uh, certain goods and once they didn't have any wood anymore they could sell and not, not their own economy running anymore the ships would just stop coming by and that of course led to uh, significant problems in the Easter Islands. This is so because there are strong dependencies built up in a complex trading system and of course globally speaking we have significant dependencies just momentarily where I record this video. We have these problems, for example, in Ukraine, gas uh, supply by Russia to many nations and political influence in Ukraine. It's a complex system, apparently. And another point he found is inadequate societal answers to challenges, meaning that, for example, people uh, st stuck to religion, uh, religion uh, to a certain extent, to their traditions and um, Instead of eating the food, they gave it to their gods, for example, and things like that. So this is obviously not an adequate societal answer to the challenge that is posed. And the chances that we have, that's what he found from this historical comparison, is that we have a courageous and looking ahead reaction to problems realized. And these may also require painful corrections of values. Painful means what I've just mentioned before, how many children may we have? Yeah? Is that somehow limited? Can that it be unlimited? Is that feasible in our world? Is that permissible? May I have six children if that means that some other people are starving, perhaps not today, but say in 10 years? Is that permissible? So we run into problems with the human rights. I will dwell on that in a little moment. Another point which also refers to behavior, of course, which I've mentioned already in the last uh, videos, is animal-based food. Is it permissible for us to eat animal-based food if that means that today people are starving somewhere else? And of course, there are important and f uh, famous examples are required. In this case, Paul McCartney, who explicitly states that, states that he's a vegetarian. Actually, I also found very a little bit funny the following postcard I found uh, some time ago already. It's obviously some just working person who said, when my colleagues told me that I just did not have a burger but a veggie burger, I thought, that's crazy. That was really delicious. I myself, being a vegan, so that means I don't eat any animal-based food, I can only tell you it is delicious if you only accept that you uh, or adopt the recipes you are cooking uh, then it's re really very very delicious it's not just meat and some vegetables it's much more than that and leaving well actually meat and vegetables and then leaving away the meat that of course is not very delicious so you have to change your habits somehow but then it really can be delicious let me say I don't want to convince you 
That's very important for me. I don't want to convince you. You have to decide yourself. But nevertheless, I would like to tell you the facts. And I want to tell you the facts in a way that you can reproduce them. You can go to the so data sources I have had. Everybody has them available. Do the same calculations and look at the data and see if you come to the same con conclusions. If you find something different from what I found, let me know. Okay. So now the question anyway is what can we do? And let me look at some numbers. We have seen that our energy consumption world average per year is 2,500 kilowatt hours. We have seen that already. You know this. This corresponds to 56 kilowatt hours per day. In Austria, we have 44,000, where I'm living currently, is 44,000 kilowatt hours, meaning 120 kilowatt hours per day. And now we can compare that to the different things that we use, so to speak, where we use electricity. And we see that for intensive cooking, we need 1.5 kilowatt hours, which is small as compared to these numbers. So cooking once a day or even twice a day, that's not so, so much. We can still keep that. Perhaps you want to be slightly more efficient, but that's not so dramatic. Laundry, refrigerator, freezer, all small numbers. You can improve on that, but these are really not the big numbers. Hot bath. Well, actually, first of all, short hot shower is 1.5 kilowatt hours. And these five minutes of a hot, short, a hot shower compared to the cooking for half an hour, that shows you that taking a hot bath, a hot shower, another five minutes, that's waste. Yeah? And I know some youngsters who like to take hot showers for half an hour or even longer. That's really a waste of energy. Uh, one should be aware of that. Actually, I heard once then that in Northern Europe, a shower should, in Sweden, I heard that, a shower should not take more than three minutes because otherwise the people are looking at you and thinking that the, the neighbors are thinking that you're really wasting energy. A hot bath takes six kilowatt hours, which is already 10% of the world average, average daily consumption. It's significant, so perhaps you don't want to take a hot bath every day, perhaps not even once a week, but stay, take a short shower instead. Then the light bulbs, I discussed that already in previous videos. That contributes a certain, to a certain extent, and if you have all the light bulb bulbs in your, your flat or your house, burning all the time, that is definitely a certain waste of energy, but if you just switch them on and off as you need them, that's really not a significant problem. It's if one or two or three light bulbs are, all, uh, are on all the time, no problem. Then come the big numbers. Taking a car at seven, seven liters per 100 kilometers, that's um, well sort of already a car with a certain efficiency, it's not the youngest car, maybe a little bit older, or it's a bigger car and very, very modern. You need for 40 kilometers, meaning 20 kilometers to drive to work, 20 kilometers back, it's 25 kilowatt hours. It's half of the world average that is available. Doing a short trip to Barcelona, well, you have enough money, you're, you are happy with your wife and whatever, so you spend her uh, you, 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 um, as a gift, for example, you give her a present, short trip to Barcelona for shopping, yeah, it's 700 kilowatt hours. A vacation in New York is 4,000, well, from Europe, and of course the other way around, if you come, it's also Barcelona is from Europe, of course. If you go to New York, it's 4,000 kilowatt hours. This is 10% of European average, so to speak, of the annual average. So this is 10% of what you have available per year, and it's actually 20% of the world average per year. Yeah, really dramatic amounts. Fuel oil for heating your house, for example, 1,000 liters corresponds to 10,000 kilowatt hours. And if you calculate that you have, for example, 1,000 liters per year for your fuel oil that you buy annually, or perhaps you buy more, but you can simply multiply, then this means that you need 30 kilowatt hours per day, which is again a significant contribution. So here you use, these, these are the really significant amounts. It's not the washing, not the laundry, it's not the cooking. It starts with heating, hot showers, hot bath, uh, and then traveling is pretty expensive and also the heating is pretty, pretty much what we use there. Okay, 
So there we see where we have options and of course we should start saving energy where, it really, where we really can save something, not at the small numbers but at the big numbers. That's much more efficient. Now, uh, J.R. Diamond told us that we should question the paradigms that we have. Question, well, our societal values that we have. And I just want to ask some of these questions that we ran into along the video, the sequence of the videos, at different points. How about plant-based nutrition? Is that a, isn't that a good option? The right of how many children should you have? One child, like in China, with some exceptions meanwhile, but in principle. And if you look at especially the number of children, that is very often argued about with referring to religion and the freedom to religion. So is religion really the good basis for environmentally sustainable ethics? Does that make sense? Is religion or is there an alternative to religion for defining environmental values and ethics. And with reference to the short trip to Barcelona for shopping, uh, are there socially accepted rewards for achievements that you have had in, in that are environmentally friendly? Is there something else that you can do to reward yourself that is socially accepted? Yeah. Going for a hike may be rewarding to you, but that is perhaps not really socially accepted as being as a, a re realized as a reward for yourself. Yeah? Are there other things that are more environmentally friendly? And then the overall question, how can we fulfill all human needs? And especially something going beyond that, how can we close recycle loops? We did not discuss so far about the nutrients that you uh, take out of the land area if you uh, collect the crops, how to close all these recycle loops, for example, of the nutrients of, on, the, on the land area. Which measures really make sense? This discusses a little bit which energy or where to save energy, for example. And then there come the big questions. These are more or less, well, these are big questions, of course, as well, but you can decide them more or less individually for yourself, start living properly, so to speak. You can find answers for yourself. These are the big ones. How can the, the because they are between nations, generations, and across the transition, meaning all, all along this transition from uh, fossil based society to, say, bio based or renewable based society, along that transition, every, uh, the, um, there has to be justice between the burdens between different nations and people now and people more less and people more developed, things like that. The question is, for example, how are the burdens for saving the environment distributed between developed and non or less developed countries? How are the burdens for the development itself distributed? We, as developed countries in Europe, for example, have high interest that less developed countries, for example, in Africa, are developing quickly because that decreases the overall population growth significantly. And that's actually, as we learned, one of the big problems. Shouldn't we also put more effort into that? And who should actually put effort into that? I've discussed it as well. How will trading of food and energy be organized in the future? Big transitions ahead. Yeah, food being produced in different countries as compared to today bioenergy and other types of energy, for example, produced in other places as they are solar energy produced as they are produced today. And how are violations against environmental rights being penalized? Yeah, which are the penalties for nations, for people, as they violate against these possibly uh, environmental laws or at least accepted rules? And what we need in the end, it's just a statement in the end, we need quick and strong actions because it's not like with the energy everything will be solved because solar energy will be becoming more cheaper than fossil energy, but concerning nutrition, concerning population growth, the problems are already there today. We don't have enough food for everybody today, so how do we solve these things? And we need to solve them actually today and not only in 2050 or so. Yeah, that's too late, many people have been starving all the way long until then. What I already mentioned, we should also look at a little, in a little bit more detail. These are 
some statements from United Nations declarations of human rights. And as I have mentioned already, there are contradictions in a limited world. It says, for example, in the beginning, all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. All human be people. Also those living in less developed countries. Yeah? They have the same rights as we have in more developed countries. Everyone has the right to freedom of thought, conscience and religion. Even if that means having more children or having specific uh, nutritional habits, yeah, you are free to live your religion. Men and women of all of full age have the right to marry and to found a family. This also implies to have as many children as you like. No, nowhere in the, the Declaration of Human Rights the number of children is somehow addre addressed. Yeah? So you are fully free to have as many children as you like. Everyone has a right to social security and is entitled to realization of the economic, social and cultural rights indispensable for his dignity and the free development of his personality. Do you really believe that that is ensured in less developed nations? I don't think so. Yeah, and this is taking place today. So already today we have a, some um, competition between the human rights, between people living to different aspects of the human rights. Everyone has a right to a standard of living adequate for the health and well-being of himself and of his family, including food, clothing, housing and medical care and necessary social services. Apparently people are starving and nevertheless, according to these declarations, they have the right to get food. Who is give it, give, giving it to them? And here we already see one of the big problems. In legal systems of nations, it is frequently so that if one has the right, somebody else has an obligation. You bought a land area, you have the right to use it, and that means the obligation of the other person to stay away from that. You know, so a right of one person is coupled with an obligation of somebody else. And here only the rights are formulated. Nobody actually has the obligation. But actually it's all of us. If you take this seriously, it's all of us having these obligations. Everyone is entitled to social and international order. Okay, this means all this social security and social order means everything should be set up in a way that globally speaking all these rights can be guaranteed for everyone, everyone up here. But that is not the case. So our systems that we have today does not conform to the UN Declaration of Human Rights. So we have to change something. Apparently, if you look at the uh, annual meetings, the climate summits that you have annually, you realize that obviously the nations don't find together. So the question is, is it really possible to find a top-down approach, politicians making the rules and then everybody living according to them? Or shouldn't we ourselves individually come up with certain decisions about our behavior on food, on children, on energy consumption, on whatever, in order to be able to ensure that other people at the other end of the world are able to live their lives according to their rights they actually have. That's a question we have to solve. It's a question everybody has to answer for himself. The, the um, ethics, the sustainable ethics, if that, for example, is di dictated by religion or by some thoughts, some abstract thoughts like shown in this pre these presentations. And to formulate it more clearly, there is a contradiction between the different human rights in the limited world, the standard of living and food, the freedom of religion, the foundation of a family, as many children as you like, and the free personal development. Not all of these rights can be fulfilled in a limited world. One has to really come up with solutions for that. Summing that up, I can say, well, human rights, question mark. On the one hand side, are these really rights for everybody? And where are the obligations? We should seriously question our old habits, everybody of us, and everybody has to answer these questions for himself because you have, well, it's your own value system within yourself, so to speak, that you have lived to live up to. And don't tell, I've, don't say I haven't told you. Yeah? You know the numbers, you know the facts now. I personally think that we should not have to 
have taboos, asking questions, and we should also always ask one step further, one question further yeah. about the food, where does it come from, how, how is that then produced, and things like that. We should start saving things where it is really relevant. Yeah, I've mentioned that, perhaps not with the refrigerator, but with the hot, ba hot bathtub, for example, or the trip to wherever. It doesn't mean that you should not go for vacation, but you should be aware how much energy that costs, and perhaps instead to go into New York, you also find it in interesting from Euro Europe, as say Austria, for a trip to South Italy or so, which is significantly less, or Barcelona, which was, well, fifth of the amount. The most urgent problem is the number of the people, and the second urgent problem is the development of the people, because that means that the number of the people will be increasing less. And that then sol solves all the other problems with the resources that we have. So that was the fifth point. What does this mean for us? I hopefully have given you some perspective of where you can save or how things are interrelated, what human ra rights mean and what possibly our obligations as humanity, and humanity meaning actually every single one of us. Yeah, humanity per capita means ourselves. What does that mean? And now I would come finally to the last slide, more or less, the summary and the conclusions at the very end. I've shown that the fossil resources that are that they are available essentially to any degree that we would like to have them, only the price will further increase. The CO2 from combustion is detrimental to climate. This has been shown, but there are many other systems, uh, many other aspects concerning climate that are relevant, that are little understood. And we always have two simultaneous challenges, energy and climate. Some media, some politicians talk about energy but, and forget about climate. They say, well, we have enough energy, but they don't talk about the climate. Some people tell about climate but forget about supply or telling how to supply the energy that we need. So we have to solve both problems simultaneously. The central problem is the number of the people. I've shown that as well. I've also indicated right in the beginning that Expensive energy, this increase in price for energy means a faster population growth because people are developing more slowly, the na nations are developing more slowly, which means higher population um, increase, which means more people overall. Land area is a scarce resource, I've shown that. Bioenergy is a most, at most a partial solution. Waste bioenergy, uh, biomass used energetically is one option, but really uh, using crops to produce energy, as long as we don't change our nutritional habits, doesn't really make sense, because it always means more people are starving. Then on the long term, photovoltaics and solar thermal energy are cheap, safe, safe and sustainable and contribute can contribute large, contrib uh, large amounts of energy. But in the end, of course, we will wind up with an energy mix, a sustainable energy mix, Solar, just mentioned, wind, hydro, rest, biomass, and geothermal being some of these contributions. And we always have to seek a holistic view, looking at everything. Balances, as I have shown them, may have to this end, as well as regarding the complete recycles. I have not dwelled too much about these uh, complete recycles, but they are important concerning nutrients, for example, as well. Nutrition, nutrition and this statement should be made very clearly. Today we accept that others are hungry, others are starving. Today. We don't have to think into the future, it's already happening today. And the main available factors and those under our direct control, humanity per capita being ourselves, is that the behavior and the habits of each of us are important. I've shown this, I've shown where it is important and what you individually can do as a small input, so to speak, to solve the problems that we are facing for the future, and actually already today. With that, I've guided you through these different aspects of this topic, and I've shown hopefully that balances really can be guides towards a sustainable future. I'm happy that you St stayed with me throughout all the videos. Hopefully you did not just only click into the last video. Perhaps you really stayed with me through all the videos. I've learned a little bit about that and see a little bit now the picture more as a whole, how the things are interrelated. I hope this helps you 
to understand those things that the media and the politicians try to tell you and try to put those things in a little bit more global perspective. Thank you very much.